Welcome to Mom in Mind, where we dive into all aspects of perinatal mental health and wellness related to pregnancy, birth, loss, postpartum, and new parenthood. It's so much more than postpartum depression. We raise the volume on all of these topics in the hopes that someday everyone will have the support and info that they deserve before they need it. Please note this podcast is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Kat. We're bringing you another fantastic episode of Mom in Mind, this time talking about chiropractic care for perinatal women. We are going to be talking with Dr. Elliot Berlin, who is an award-winning prenatal chiropractor, childbirth educator, and labor doula. In this episode, we're going to touch on really what is chiropractic care for perinatal women? What does it look like? What kinds of conditions are treated? Some common misconceptions. How can chiropractic care support mental wellness and very specifically perinatal mood or anxiety disorders? And then we'll be able to hear more about the kind of work that Dr. Berlin does, which is just fantastic. His Informed Pregnancy Project aims to utilize multiple forms of media, including a weekly podcast called Informed Pregnancy, documentary films, and YouTube series to compile and deliver unbiased information about pregnancy and childbirth to empower new and expected parents to make informed choices regarding their pregnancy and parenting journey. Once you hear this, you'll hear how committed he is to really giving as much unbiased information to people as possible. I'm really happy to bring you this episode today. So let's hear from Dr. Berlin. Welcome, Dr. Berlin. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm very excited to talk with you today. I had your wife, also Dr. Berlin, on this podcast a couple months ago and happy to bring in your work as well. Can you tell us a bit about what you do? Sure. You know, I started off as a chiropractor and before that I was planning to go to medical school. And even from the time I was pretty young, I started taking CPR, first aid, responding to emergencies. I became an EMT when I was 17, started working in ambulances when I was 18. Medicine was going to be my jam. Mm. When I was in college taking my prereqs, my father suddenly died partially from a medical mix-up. And I was young, 19, and it just kind of made me rethink a little bit. Drugs and surgery as a primary approach to mm. health care. Mm. I still have deep respect for medicine. I have deep respect for drugs and surgery and the people who spend their whole life learning how to use them in the best way possible. But I wanted to be on the more holistic side. So I took a little time off. I started to study different modalities and the combination of chiropractic and massage therapy together really resonated strongly with me, addressing the musculoskeletal system from both the muscular and skeletal side. So I went to school for both of those. As my wife, you mentioned, was finishing her psychology training and I was finishing my chiropractic training, we thought, let's have a kid. And despite following the instructions, no baby came. So mm-hmm. we ended up going down this long, interesting fertility journey, a medical fertility journey first. And when those things were not effective, then we kind of moved into a more holistic fertility journey. And before you knew it, we had our first baby. And then every two years, another baby came. <laughs> and it was like, we couldn't turn it off. Uh, <laughs> And so when we moved to Los Angeles, uh, now about 15 years ago, we started a program to help other people kind of just naturally improve their health and improve their fertility. And pretty early on, it led to a lot of babies. And so Hmm. we ended up being surrounded by newly pregnant women who wanted to continue their wellness care, their chiropractic and massage care. And Hmm. since a lot of people are not comfortable or don't have experience working on pregnancy. The fact that we were even doing it just drew in the floodgates. I'm sure. And so now it's like almost all we do is is pre and postnatal care. So I'm a chiropractor, but I also do massage work. I smush them together. People always have the option to just do adjustments or if they prefer. Or mm-hmm. Usually, though, our uniqueness is kind of like the peanut butter and chocolate of wellness. We mix together massage and chiropractic, and it turns out really well. And so that's mostly what I do. And what I, we have other doctors here who I train in the same technique. And it sort of grew from there into attending birth because sometimes there's a body work value during labor mm-hmm. at a birth. And after attending enough births to do body work, at some point it just became uncomfortable. Sort of the midwife or doula or and partner were all asleep and I'm doing body work on someone sometimes who I just met for the first time. Mm-hmm. And as things pick up and start to progress, they'll look back and say, hey, 
you know, help me, coach me, guide me. And I'm like, I don't know. I just rub things and crack stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so eventually I thought I should do doula training because that would be helpful, you mm-hmm. know, in those situations. And my wife was getting much more involved in pregnancy and postpartum as well. So we did it together you know, we became Aww. a couple of doulas. And That's been, great. Yeah, it's been a really cool ride just going to birth all the time. I just recently kind of tried to retire from birth, but they're not having it. I'm assuming you're in very high demand. Well, yeah, interestingly enough. I mean, I normally I would think to myself, if I was in the middle of labor, I would not want the big hairy man to come in <laughs> and squeeze my hips. But, you know, for most of my patients, we have a strong relationship during pregnancy and so mm-hmm. it becomes a comfort for them during childbirth. So even though I'm not on call anymore, I do get called into birth periodically. Mm-hmm. You know, if the baby's stuck or if there's back labor, if the baby's not dropping or rotated well, then we try to make space, musculoskeletal space for, for things to start progressing again. That's so cool. I just love the work that you do and I love how much it embodies of the whole process. You know, you're not just doing one thing. Thing, even though being a chiropractor is not just one thing, but there's so much that goes into what you do. You have such a holistic perspective of the whole process. Yeah, that developed over time. I mean, I come from a medical background, so emergency rooms, drug surgery, those were my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. When it comes to even pregnancy and birth, even though I was doing chiropractic and massage early on, I didn't really understand that much about pregnancy and birth. I thought like most people, like, mm-hmm. you know, you get pregnant and then you grow a baby and when the time comes to go to the hospital and do all the medical stuff, it was only over time of working with more and more pregnant women. And I think in a holistic setting like ours, chiropractic, people who do chiropractic and yoga and massage oftentimes plan for a more natural, uninterventive birth. Mm -hmm. And they were just coming back, you know, again and again, people would say, oh yeah, I had to get induced. And then this happened and more and more interventions and Mm -hmm. before you knew it I was having a cesarean and I'm not sure why I was having a cesarean or somebody would come and say hey do you know somebody a doctor who would support me I want to do a vaginal birth after cesarean Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about that I thought you know if they're not doing them it must be dangerous Mm -hmm. and the more I would just start to read and research things weren't adding up I'm like vaginal birth after cesarean has a risk associated with it that a repeat C-section wouldn't have, but then the repeat C-section has risks that a vaginal birth after cesarean wouldn't have. And the numbers or the amount of risk, the percentage of risk are not so different from each other. So Mm. it became a wonder in my mind why we support one and not the other, you know, Mm. and I just started to read more and question more and learn more. And before you knew it, I just realized there's not enough access to this information. And so that's when I started to compile information and just write articles that became a blog that became a magazine that we published for six years and now it's sort of turned into podcasting and making documentaries and youtube series it's just sort of about compiling that information i don't have an agenda for any of my patients other than that they have options available to them they know the pros and cons of the choices and they're in the driver's seat together with their practitioners in terms of making those choices Right. It makes perfect sense then that your podcast would be called Informed Pregnancy because that's exactly it. You're giving people information and in your work, but this is what kind of runs through your blood, it sounds like, is making sure people have as much information as possible and choices and all of that. Yeah, well, these days I see about 15 pregnant patients a day and they have varying degrees of information or ideas on what they want when they come in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just generally in the nature of our conversation, try to get a better idea of what do they want and do they know what choices are available to them. Sure. And now that we've created the media that we have, and uh, there's lots of other great media like your podcast that I think are put people in a better position to be able to get their hands on that information in a very digestible way. Right. And then make choices, you know, make choices together with their providers and have the experiences that they want to have. I don't right. think there's anything wrong with any of those interventions. I think induction is fine. I think all the different pain relief options, they're not just fine, they're great. A cesarean is great. Somebody who needs a cesarean that right. has access to one, that's the greatest thing in the world. Someone who needs a cesarean that doesn't have access is one of the worst things that I can think right. of. It's just that they're all good when used 
A, sparingly, and B, with consent, if it's mm -hmm. something that somebody wants to do. And so this okay. digestible media formats that are coming out, I think, put people in a position where they can better make those choices. Yeah, absolutely. 100% with you there. So I'm sort of thinking of when I'm talking with people and maybe referring them to chiropractic care, they look at me kind of sideways and say, oh, what, mm -hmm. chiropractors during pregnancy? What do you mean? chiropractors after pregnancy, what for? So what are some of the common conditions or things that people are coming in for, at least initially, related to pregnancy or postpartum? Sure. Some people who, especially who were doing chiropractic beforehand, just for wellness and maintenance, continue to do it for wellness and maintenance. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people come for the first time during pregnancy because symptoms pop up pretty commonly during pregnancy, mm -hmm. sciatica of pregnancy, which is different than regular sciatica. It's compression of the sciatic nerve very specifically like in the upper buttock, in the glute muscle, under the piriformis muscle. And it just compresses that outer bundle of the nerve and it becomes very painful and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It can become hard to walk. It's so easily treatable in most cases with chiropractic and massage care. Low back pain and hip pain, it becomes pretty common. Somebody, for example, has an old injury. Once you start straining that injury with the weight of the pregnancy, then you start to feel it. People get hip pain just from sleeping on their hips, especially if they're not mm. used to sleeping on their hips. Mid-back and rib pain, sometimes the ribs get compressed and the intercostal nerve gets a little bit pinched and it feels very uncomfortable, but it's fairly easy to treat. For other people, it's neck and shoulders, especially if the sleeping position or the difficulty sometimes people have in finding a comfortable sleeping position and getting good sleep can really jack up the scaling muscles or mm. the neck and shoulders. Sometimes the wrists and feet become painful, either because the nerve or blood vessel coming down from the neck and shoulders and upper chest is getting compressed, especially at nighttime. And so the wrists become and hands become uncomfortable or sometimes mm -hmm. just from fluid building up. There's so much fluid and it, it settles in the gravitational low points. During pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, actually people sometimes get headaches who didn't have headaches before, mm -hmm. migraine headaches or tension headaches. Sure. Um, towards the end of pregnancy, there's a lot of strain on the pubic joint and people get pubic symphysis dysfunction, mm -hmm. which can be very uncomfortable and very debilitating in terms of daily activities. It can be very hard to walk on it sometimes. Yeah, I saw a chiropractor during my pregnancy. I had pelvic shearing and it was incredibly painful, but it really helped quite a bit by chiropractic support. So in all the things I just mentioned, some respond better than others, but most mm -hmm. of them respond really, really well. If you did not have the problem, and then now you're pregnant and the problem shows up, we can usually make it much better, less intense, less frequent, or go away altogether. You know, towards the end of pregnancy, the round ligaments sometimes flare up, very easy to treat. Uh, heartburn, there's different sources of heartburn, but there's some techniques that we can use that about 50% of the people respond really well to getting rid of the heartburn. Nausea is more difficult, but sometimes we can help with nausea. Mm. And also positioning. So, you know, you said during pregnancy and after pregnancy. Here's one of the key things. The pelvis is a musculoskeletal structure. Mm -hmm. And it kind of is supposed to be a loose open rubber band at the end of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And the baby's head that has to come through that structure is bigger. The head's bigger than the pelvis. And it's kind of like a basketball. So how do you get this big basketball to slide through this smaller rubber band? Mm -hmm. And the answer is function. The head is, if it was a basketball, it's not fully inflated, so it can smush through a smaller opening. Mm -hmm. And the pelvis is supposed to be really loose, relaxed, open, and fluid, and be able to accommodate like a stretchy rubber band, mm -hmm. that bigger basketball coming through. But if the pelvis is stiff, tight, restricted, the muscles and tendons have this extra strong grip, the joints between the bones of the pelvis don't have good movement between them, then it makes for a much more rigid and not giving structure. The body's making hormones like relax and the progesterone goes up very high to make everything loose and open. Mm -hmm. But it may be minimally effective if there's so much dysfunction, tightness, especially mm. in the musculoskeletal structure that is the pelvis. So a lot of what we do at the end of pregnancy is opening up that space, again, with deep tissue massage around the front and back of the pelvis and chiropractic adjustments to get the joints moving better. A lot of times people come out with babies that are not positioned quite right. We don't do anything to the baby. We don't try to turn or manipulate a baby, but we do open up the pelvis around the baby. Babies typically want to be head down. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's structural reasons that get in the way, like a short cord 
or a placenta that's in the way, or the fluid's too high or low, or the uterus has a variation in the shape. But sometimes it's just functional. Mm -hmm. If we can overcome that, if we can improve the function, then we can potentially set her up for a better pre-birth positioning and the same thing for post-birth recovery. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And and as you were talking through all of the many, many things that could make someone uncomfortable or make pregnancy difficult or even birth difficult, I was wondering, you know, about the stress that that puts on the body, but then also the stress that that puts on someone emotionally and mentally to have that sort of pain. How have you seen this chiropractic care be supportive for just mental wellness in general and or perinatal mood or anxiety disorders? Well, I think that if if you take someone who's pretty active and mobile and feels good in their body, and then if with the strain of pregnancy, they become somebody who has sciatica or pubic bone pain or other things that limit or inhibit their ability to be as active and mobile as they were before, plus the added strain, added weight, the mobility is harder to begin with. Those people, I think, are at greater risk of becoming sad, feeling blue, and not having the outlet of physical activity that they had before. Mm -hmm. So if we can restore that, that's probably the number one thing we can do to help with mental health. It's through the ability to vent off steam and be physically active and release all the good things that come to the body when you are physically active without pain. On the flip side, when you have chronic pain and you're making cortisol all the time, that naturally leads to sadness and anxiousness. So it's this duality where we can either have you burning off steam and feeling really good or unable to burn off steam and feeling a lot less good. Also in our practice, I would say if we can improve sleep, So Mm -hmm. sometimes people are so uncomfortable with the hip pain or the neck pain and they can't really sleep. They wake up and they toss and turn a lot. Mm -hmm. Not being able to get that uninterrupted sleep, certainly before the baby comes, and to maximize whatever sleep windows there are after the baby comes, having that exhaustion and fatigue naturally lends itself to not feeling as well emotionally and even hormonally. So if we can improve sleep, we can do a lot to help with both pre- and postnatal mental health. Mm. Yeah, I really hope that people can hear this because I would love for more and more people to be seeking services like yours that just encompass the whole body wellness also. And like you said before, we don't all understand how our moods are affected by our physical ailments and whatnot. We just don't get this information. So I think, you know, for people hearing that getting this kind of care, both massage and chiropractic support can help with their mood. It can help with, you know, birth outcomes or anyways, I don't know about birth outcomes, but how birth progresses and how somebody feels after in the postpartum period is just one more really great tool. Sure. And we add massage in our practice specifically to almost every session. There's at least 25 minutes of massage and body work, which has a few things. Massage has some known benefits for mental health. There's several studies on different populations on anxiousness and depression with massage and how they respond positively to it. But also it kind of gives us an opportunity sometimes to just talk for mom to just say what's on her mind and get things that are bothering her off her mind or to address them. Or it gives us an opportunity to say, you know, I know you're giving so much to your baby, let's say postnatally, but what are you doing for yourself? How is your nutrition? And sometimes just a few simple nutrition tricks Mm -hmm. can go a long way to balance the dopamine and serotonin, balance the blood sugar, the insulin and glucagon. And so those things, again, hormonally can really make a big difference in in how she's doing through that transitionary period. Have you all heard of or seen the Ritual Vitamin, that really cool looking clear capsule? Well, now they have a prenatal that is just as awesome, if not more. What I love about Ritual Essential for Women and now this prenatal is how much thought and research they've put into the vitamins. As an example, you know, doctors often tell women to take folic acid during pregnancy, right? However, a third of women can't really even effectively absorb it. The Ritual prenatal features a methylated form of folate that supports the needs of all women. Ritual is kind of like the prenatal vitamin reborn. From the methylated folate to vitamin D3, the obsessively researched Ritual Essential prenatal with DHA is conceived to deliver the 12 essential nutrients a woman needs at every stage. Nothing more, nothing less. Another thing that I love is that you can go onto their website and literally see where all of the ingredients came from. 
If you're a label reader like me, the vegan-friendly, sugar-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, and allergen-free ingredients in Ritual Essential Prenatal are 100% traceable. Whether you're living life or creating it, why not add some good-looking science into your daily routine? Visit ritual.com slash mind to start your ritual today. That's ritual.com slash M-I-N-D. Are you seeing people coming in with like postpartum depression or pregnancy anxiety, anything like that, and getting relief from chiropractic care and massage? I would say that we're a part of, we're generally a part of the puzzle. We play a role in the puzzle. I think that it's sort of hard for me and my training to separate from baby blues, which would be more normal than more of an anxiousness or mm-hmm. PMAD. But I definitely see people who come in feeling nervous, anxious, and a little sad, mm-hmm. and then leave the visit. Not only do they leave the visit looking and feeling better with more of a bounce in their step, mm-hmm. but they'll write later that day or the next day saying thanks a lot, just even for that chat or for releasing yeah. the tension in my shoulders or helping me realize that I was clenching my jaw so tight and getting some of these things out. But I also work together with my wife, with Dr. Alyssa, who you've you've mentioned earlier and have had on the podcast. So if I see things that just seem a little bit more than the -the run-of-the-mill postpartum adjustment, then I would always recommend that they see her just and she does an evaluation and she's able to chat with them on a much deeper level. So it's sort of like teamwork. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Everywhere should have this. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a great combo of services to offer. And I know you do so much there in your clinic. I'm curious if you hear any misconceptions, like things that people say, oh, I was never going to go to uh, chiropractic care before because, but they're coming in and getting help. What Um, kind of misconceptions? Yeah. I mean, there's everything under the sun. The most common one that people call about and ask about is, Once I see a chiropractor, once I get an adjustment, do I need to always keep coming back to a chiropractor and get an adjustment? Mm -hmm. And the answer is definitely not. I mean, especially during pregnancy, if we're treating something that is related to the pregnancy, so we'll treat it. And sometimes it goes away and you don't even have to come back during the pregnancy. But if Mm -hmm. it's something that's going to keep coming up because of the pregnancy, we treat you through the pregnancy. We see you a couple of times after you have the baby. And then if you want to keep doing maintenance in your body, you do. And if you were just coming for that particular issue, then you don't. And mm-hmm. lots of people do and lots of people don't. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one common misconception about it. During pregnancy, another misconception is that pregnancy itself is a contraindication to going to see a chiropractor mm-hmm. and even to getting massage. Sometimes people won't go get a massage or massage therapists are afraid to use any kind of effective pressure because somebody's pregnant. And I think those are both wrong. I don't think anybody needs good chiropractic and massage more probably than somebody who's mm-hmm. pregnant. So right. constantly under the physical strain, the extra load and right. the, everything that comes along with, you know, to have a good work through and tune up is probably the best time to do it. And so I think massage therapists who focus on pregnancy and chiropractors who focus on pregnancy, they've done typically some extra training and have more experience working with pregnancy. So they know the things that we would do differently, the modifications that we would do, and they know how we can deliver safe and effective Mm. body work and adjustments to the people who need it most. Sure. Yeah, that makes me wonder then it's probably pretty important to find somebody who knows what they're doing, I guess. How do you suggest that people look for a chiropractor or even a massage therapist who will be able to address these very specific things related to perinatal period? Yeah, I think that, first of all, one thing that's important to kind of understand is that any chiropractor is capable of doing chiropractic on pregnant women that you don't have to be specially trained. You don't have to have a certification, for example. There is no real Mm -hmm. certification Mm -hmm. in prenatal or postnatal chiropractic. However, I think that a lot of chiropractors don't do it. There's just a lot of concern about liability within working on pregnant women, I think, across all fields. That's true. Yeah, all fields. And I also think that if you find somebody who has additional training, which there is postgraduate training in chiropractic for pregnancy, and you find somebody who tends to work in this population, they're going to be doing more than just doing chiropractic on a pregnant woman with the modifications that that are meant not to harm. Right. But 
they're going to be working more with chiropractic for the pregnancy. How can we mm-hmm. use chiropractic mm-hmm. to make this pregnancy better, more functional, mm-hmm. get ready for a great birth experience to recover from the marathon that is birth, <laughs> uh, no matter how you do it. Right. It's a lot on the body, you know. So I was just talking earlier about somebody today about a study that was done on breech babies. And they had roughly 1,000 women deliver breech babies vaginally and 1,000 by cesarean. And right after the birth, the babies seemed more fatigued, more strained a little bit, stressed after the vaginal birth. And I'm like, yeah, it's the difference between running a marathon and taking an Uber, you know. (laughs) Of course, they're more strained after the birth. It's a much right. more active journey. Right. So giving birth is great. It's a strength. It's powerful. It's vitality. But it's also a lot of work on the mind and body. And so mm-hmm. to, to get some therapeutic relief afterwards is helpful. So I would recommend there's an organization called the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association, ICPA. Mm. And they have a website called ICPA, the number four kids, ICPA for kids.com. Mm-hmm. And on there, they have a listing, a directory search by zip code within the United States, and they have some international countries as well. And at least there, you can find chiropractors who have done their trainings, who are certified in their techniques, and who have expressed interest, time, and effort in working with pediatrics and pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you would cross-reference that with either recommendations from friends or online reviews to make sure that you're going into a quality place. Right. Well, thank you for that. And a lot of people listening right now may be just hearing for the first time about this option as support. So yeah, any resource like that is fantastic. So I mean, you do so much really great work. I would love to shift just slightly and learn more about the Informed Pregnancy podcast and some of the other projects that you have. But specifically, if you can start with the podcast and talk a little bit about the type of topics you cover there. Sure. Podcasting is interesting. I mean, you do. It's a lot of work to do Mm -hmm. them. To have a good podcast takes long before you start recording and afterwards before you release it. My first podcast I recorded in an expensive studio with guests that took me forever to get it all done. And I did weeks and weeks of research for it. It cost a fortune and I wanted to edit it and edit it and edit it. And I didn't release it for like seven months. Um, I think I did maybe two or three episodes that year. And the next year I was proud of myself. We doubled it. We're finally at a point where we do one a week and we have a great audience interaction. Our audience really sends us good feedback, sometimes great constructive criticism, which I'm completely open to and appreciate, Um, and topic ideas, things that they want to hear about. Mm -hmm. But essentially what I'm going for is a combination of informative and entertaining, and we cover topics like pregnancy, postpartum, early parenting, from the physical aspect, the hormonal aspect, the emotional aspect, and from the aspect of making informed choices. So I bring on a lot of experts. You know, one of the maybe slightly more controversial episodes is a three-part series on vaccines. Every parent has to make vaccine decisions, you know, Mm -hmm. and however you feel about vaccines, I don't know how you can make those decisions without even understanding what it is that we're vaccinating against Mm. and how those vaccines work and what the vaccine history is. So after people listen to it, we have two pediatricians. We have one who's very, very pro-vaccine. Every vaccine that was ever made, you know, she believes every (laughs) child should have it. And the other pediatrician, also practicing pediatrician, is a bit more skeptical. He Mm. believes that vaccines are helpful and effective sometimes, but that with anything you put into the body that's foreign, you need to do a risk-benefit analysis. How is this vaccine? What's the risk of doing it versus not doing it? What would the risk of the disease be for this child? And so you do a risk-benefit analysis before you give the drug. And if it makes sense, then you do. And if it doesn't, then you don't. And also they address the more social issue, even if this isn't Mm -hmm. the greatest thing for this particular child, is there herd immunity and a social responsibility to give this vaccine? They address it all. And Mm -hmm. I don't really have a stance on it on the episode, but I do have the stance that you should be able to get the information and together with your provider, make an Mm -hmm. informed choice and Mm -hmm. act out that choice, not just blindly do whatever, you know, whatever you're told to do just Mm -hmm. because. In today's day and age in healthcare, there's so many things pulling providers and facilities and manufacturers in different directions 
not all of them are in you as the patient or me as a patient is not all of them are in our best interest. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes let's say I have a breech baby. So my doctor may have several options to offer me, but some of them may have more or less liability for them, which doesn't affect me as a patient or my wife as a patient, but they're going to maybe take that one off the table or try very hard to not get you to pick that one. Mm -hmm. because there's other options that have less liability for them. Mm -hmm. So that's just one. Sometimes insurance will pay for something or not pay for something. That's another one. Sometimes mm -hmm. things are more or less convenient, more or less time consuming for a provider or manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors at play. I think in today's day and age, you need to be an active participant in so your own true. care. Yeah. So Informed Pregnancy Podcast is me bringing on different experts from different backgrounds and presenting topics you know, with all the facts and ideally in an unbiased way so that you can come away from it thinking and say, hmm, what do I want to do here? Or mm -hmm. maybe I need to have a conversation with my doctor or my midwife. And then we couple that with celebrity interviews and we couple that with also moms and partners just sharing their birth stories, sometimes before and after where you do an episode getting ready for a birth. We just interviewed a midwife who was having her first baby before she had her baby. And I think it's kind of interesting because she's had 10 so many pregnancies and births mm -hmm. as a midwife. And now she just had her baby and she's going to come back and tell us how the experience was actually going through it herself. Wow. That's a great idea. I yeah. love that. Thank you. So, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. To get both perspectives and the follow-up, just so, so good. So good. All of this is so good. It's just, I really appreciate your work. It thank is you. so it's necessary. Usual. Well, thank you. It's just so necessary to be 100% with you about giving information and as much information from as many different perspectives as possible. Obviously, ideally, evidence-based when possible, but really, really putting it, putting it out there is such an amazing offering. We have two other sets of media. One is a YouTube series called The Real Midwives of Los Angeles. How fun. And that is entirely, well, there's some celebrity birth stories on there too, but it's really just different women who are pregnant. And I interview this one now with pictures and video about their pregnancy and things that come up for them during pregnancy and how they're planning for their various different types of births. I mean, ideally, we will cover home birth and hospital birth. We'll cover free birth, midwife birth, obstetrician birth. We'll cover vaginal birth with medication, vaginal birth without medication, cesarean birth, elective primary cesarean birth. We want to cover everything because mm -hmm. there's so many choices to make, and I don't think any of them are bad choices. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to just see other people picking those choices and making their plans and seeing how they go. So we always bring those women back after they have the baby, sometimes with their partners too, but always with a midwife to kind of help her process the experience that she had. That's so and, cool. Oh, thanks. And yeah. then also to help the audience like answer questions right. that they may be thinking about that experience and help them kind of like the things that if somebody's had a birth experience, the things that after they come out, it's like, what do you wish somebody would have told you uh -huh. before you did that, that now you learned by doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. So we want to share that with our audience. And then the final thing is two documentaries. One of them is called Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Delivery, which is a mm -hmm. short documentary about the disappearing art of vaginal breach delivery. There's a whole history there that we could probably do a whole episode on. But <laughs> I'm sure uh, vaginal breech birth is sort of hard to come by in the world in general, but in the United States specifically. It's sort of making a little bit of a comeback because the recommendation was that all babies that are breached should be born by C section in 2001. But in 2006, it kind of softened up a little bit to say, wait, maybe we were too quick in making that suggestion. Wow. There are some people for whom a vaginal breech birth would, could be a great idea. But it's kind of hard to find doctors and midwives who can do it these days or who are willing to. Mm -hmm. And so the movie kind of delves into that and why we shouldn't let that art disappear. Mm -hmm. And the other one's about feedback directly, mm -hmm. vaginal birth after cesarean. It's for women who are pregnant for the second or third time who previously only had cesarean births that they all didn't want and to, to varying degrees may not mm -hmm. have needed. And now they're pregnant again, and they want to have a more empowered experience, a more informed experience to be in the driver's seat, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. 
to not just let things happen to them, but be more active in their participation. And it's a very powerful full-length documentary. And those women really share their intimate stories because they want to help other people kind of have their second birth the first time around. Mm-hmm. Not, not to fall into the same pitfalls that maybe they fell into. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's really powerful. And all of that can be accessed from your website? You know, the easiest way to get it actually is on Instagram. On Instagram, um, Dr. Berlin spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-B-E-R-L-I-N. Okay. And then my bio link is a link to all of the media, the podcasts, the YouTube series, the documentaries. Oh, that's well, great. Whatever else we do, it'll be there. <laughs> right. I'm sure the list of things you do is very long, both you and your wife and your clinic. Um, you just do so much really great work. Yeah, we mm-hmm. feel blessed to be doing what we do in terms of work. We both love what we do. And thank God we have this great family with really sweet kids. And mm-hmm. so it's a bit of a juggle, but we're <laughs> in that position where we love being at work and we love being at home and we just Aww. have to find the balance. Right. That process, I think, is just ongoing, right? Always. Always, right. Well, I thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your knowledge and your wisdom and your resources. I'm really hoping that since people can hear directly from you about how helpful chiropractic care can be during the perinatal period of time, that they will get that support. And hopefully that will also help with their mental wellness during the perinatal time. For sure. And I would also like to say we get questions from around the country and around the world, really. For some reason, a lot from France. I couldn't tell you why. Uh, (laughs) But I'm always open to, even for someone who's never going to be a patient of ours, uh, if there's any way we can help you find a local resource or anything like that, anybody can always feel free to reach us at our email, info at drberlin.com. Wow. Thank you so much for offering that. What you're doing is rare and beautiful. And just even offering your time like that for resources is just awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it was such a pleasure to talk with you, and I'm so excited to share this with the audience. Thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks again for having me and for all the great work that you do. Thank you. So as Dr. Berlin said, the best way to access all of his media is through his bio link on Instagram, at Dr. Berlin, where you can find links to all of the things that he talked about today. He's also on Twitter at Dr. Berlin and Facebook at Informed Pregnancy. If you guys haven't yet checked out the Informed Pregnancy podcast, go check that out. Both of our podcasts are also available in the Parents on Demand network, where you can find a bunch of other parenting-related podcasts. As usual, if this is your first time with us, please go subscribe to Mom and Mind so you can get each of our episodes delivered directly to you every Monday. Or check out any of our backlog of episodes to find what you're interested in listening to. You're always welcome to join us on our Mom and Mind Connection Facebook group where we dive just a bit deeper into these conversations around perinatal mental health. So great to have you here today. Until next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please share this podcast. Together we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Come connect with us at momandmind.com. Mom and Mind.